Welcome to our last lecture for the semester. And today is going to be a short one talking about basically a wrap up of the course, sustainability and culture, and some possible directions for the future. Um, so before getting into the little bit of material we have for today, one quick announcement which is that we have our third and final exam coming up in about a week. Uh, so it will be on Thursday, May 14th from 8 to 12 p.m. The exam was initially scheduled from 8 to 10. We need to take it at the time SDSU has assigned us, but I've also extended that time period to build a little bit of flexibility in so that you can begin the exam anytime from 8 a.m. on but you have to complete and have it submitted by 12 p.m. noon. So you have a four hour window to take the exam. You'll have two hours to take the multiple choice. And the essay question you'll be submitting on Turnitin, uh, just like we did with exam two. And so I highly recommend you prepare your response to the essay question in advance. Um, again, you should study and prepare for the test ahead of time as if you were taking it in class. There won't be time for you to search for the answer to each question during the exam. So prepare accordingly ahead of time and be sure to read the study guide in full. Uh, it tells you exactly what you're responsible for and it also tells you which essay question is going to be on the exam. So I urge you to take advantage of that and prepare your response to that question ahead of time. That way you've got the essay portion of the exam nailed. Um, and then you can take the multiple choice as well. Make sure to use your own words on the essay so that you're not plagiarizing. Um, and then review the material, right? As many times as you need until it starts to stick. So with your essays, it should be a clear, coherent argument. Um, use examples and details to illustrate and support the main points you're making. Um, don't just give me a sort of a bullet pointed list of ideas and concepts loosely related to the question. It should be concise. And appropriate. Um, and then lectures, readings, films are all fair game. Pay particular attention to the material we've covered more than once, um, themes and topics that keep coming back up. If you have any questions about the exam, please, please contact me. Uh, email, Zoom, discussion board, get in touch. So for today, you should have read a few readings. Uh, Elgin was one of them, this piece, voluntary, the Voluntary Simplicity Movement. And so one of the things that Elgin is talking about is this concept of affluenza. Um, affluenza derived from affluent and influenza, the flu. It refers to this epidemic of overconsumption. Uh, recall our IPAT equation from way back in the beginning of the term. Um, I, representing overall human impact on the environment, is a combination of multiple factors, overall population, but also affluence, i.e. consumption, and the role that technology might play, which can go both ways. Trends, data show, affluence, consumption, and especially increasing consumption rates are the major threats, some of the main things impacting sustainability. There's no real technological fix to the problem of overconsumption. On top of that, has all of this added consumption um, really made us any happier? And, th and think about it for a moment. When you are thinking about what has been rewarding in your life, when you're sort of spacing out and daydreaming and thinking about stuff, what is it that you think about? I mean, maybe sometimes it's your new iPhone or a new shirt or new shoes you just got, but that usually fades, right? Um, at least for me, my two cents, it's, it's trips I've been on. It's Carita from Solomon Islands. It's my friends. It's inside jokes. It's family. It's experiences and relationships, right? Um, and data shows experiences and relationships are the bigger predictors of happiness rather than income and stuff. Um, and so one way to look at it, right, is become more simple in terms of the amount of stuff we have. Um, importantly, it's voluntary simplicity. So it's not about denying yourself. It's about being purposeful and conscious in what you choose to consume. Um, do I actually need or want this? Does this actually 
serve a function or, or bring me happiness, or is it sort of unnecessary clutter? It's about being purposeful and conscious. It's not about denial. And so one possible alternative um, to this problem of affluence of overconsumption is, as suggested by Elgin, this voluntary simplicity movement. And it's all about living more simply materially, but enriching our lives in the non-material aspects. Um, so just from the Elgin reading, he says, true growth, the ability of a society to transfer increasing amounts of energy and attention from the material side of life to the non-material side of life, and thereby to advance its culture, its capacity for compassion, sense of community, and strength of democracy. Enrich the non-material side of life. This is what he says is true growth, or what we might refer to as progress. And it sort of makes sense, especially if you look at the data, um, wages have gone up, income's gone up. We have more stuff than we did 50 or 60 years ago, but happiness is remarkably stagnant over the lifespan. Um, and so voluntary simplicity, it's not about going backwards or denying progress or living in poverty. Um, poverty is not voluntary. Poverty is involuntary. Um, it's also not about checking out and living rurally or going back to nature um, and getting rid of all your stuff. It's about moving forward, uh, being conscious, being purposeful in what we choose to use and do. And so Elgin sort of compares these two different uh, worldviews between the industrial era, sort of uh, the commercial world, Western developed capitalist countries, and the ecological era view, which is sort of in the voluntary simplicity vein. And he says ecological living um, sort of the values that it embodies here on the right. This is a, actually quite a sophisticated response to the demands of deteriorating industrial society. Um, a lot of us have really experienced um, limited benefits from the massive amount of economic growth over the past half a century or so. And so to, just to compare a little bit, um, the industrial era view sort of emphasizes the in individual um, conspicuous consumption, the good life. This is dependent upon having enough money to buy access to life's pleasures and avoid life's discomforts. Um, your identity as a person is defined by material possessions. Think conspicuous consumption um, and your social position. The individual is defined by his or her body and is ultimately separate and alone, right? The, we learn this shit in fucking elementary school, the rugged individual, right? Americans, uh, manifest destiny, um, the bootstrap, you know, ideology. You too can make it if you just work hard enough. Um, and we largely emphasize the individual over the group. In contrast, the ecological era view, uh, the goal in life is to co-evolve both the material and spiritual aspects of life. The emphasis is on conservation and frugality. Um, using what you need, a satisfying life emerges with balanced development in cooperation with others. Identity is revealed through loving and creative participation in life. Um, the individual is both unique and also inseparably part of the larger universe. Identity is not limited to our physical existence. So on the one hand, the individual is emphasized, and you can see some of the results of that type of thinking. On the other hand, the community, the group being emphasized. The industrial era view, just to sort of summarize, it emphasizes material wealth. Um, this is sort of the marker of the good life of status. In contrast, ecological view emphasizes the invisible wealth of experiential riches, relationships, experiences, the non-material aspects of life. Um, industrial era view, cutthroat competition, each man for himself. Let the free market take care of the rest. Let people compete and see what happens. Um, in contrast, ecological era view, fair competition, cooperation, and also self-responsibility. Um, people should not pretend as if their actions do not affect other people. They do. Um, right? We're all connected. On the industrial era side, uh, the universe is sort of for our exploitation, right? And this makes sense. This goes hand in hand with this emphasis on the individual and his or her success and material wealth. In contrast, ecological era. 
the universe is an extension of us. We're all connected. We need it. We rely on it. And therefore, we should take care of it. Um, Elgin sort of talks also about, according to a few different polls, um, I think Time Magazine and also CNN, and this is an older poll, it was 1991, um, but some results from a poll and a story called The Simple Life. Um, and it sound, according to the results, um, again, many of us haven't really benefited from the increasing material wealth in the world in the last half a century or so. Um, the, just some results. 69% of the people surveyed said they'd like to slow down and live a more relaxed life, in contrast to only 19% who said they'd like to live a more exciting, faster-paced life. 61% agreed that earning a living today requires so much effort that it's difficult to find time to enjoy life. You think about it, in the last 50, 60 years, we have made massive gains in economic efficiency because of technology. Where have all those gains in efficiency gone? Not to cutting hours, not to increasing leisure time, not to increasing our wages. Wages have been stagnant for decades, since like the 90s. Um, where, does all, where do all those benefits, all those gains actually go? Um, and the answer is by and large, they stay at the top. When asked about their priorities, 89% said it was more important these days to spend time with their families. Only 13% saw importance in keeping up with fashion trends, and just 7% thought it was worth bothering to shop for status symbol products. Um, at least that's how many admitted it, right? Uh, another survey reported in 1989 in Fortune magazine entitled Is Greed Dead found 75% of working Americans between the ages of 25 and 49 would like to see our country return to a simpler lifestyle with less emphasis on material success. Only 10% of those polled thought that earning a lot of money was an indicator of success. Um, and think about it for a minute. Sometimes power, wealth, and status go together, um, but also a lot of times jobs that carry status or prestige aren't necessarily well-paying. <clears throat> Teaching comes to mind. Um, while other jobs that are high-paying may not carry a lot of prestige, um, like construction or plumbing. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be high prestige. I'm just basing this in American stereotypes. <clears throat> Um, so is earning a lot of money, is that what it's all about? Is that what brings satisfaction to us? Uh, these polls reveal that a large fraction of the American public has experienced the limited rewards from the material riches of a consumer society and is looking for the experiential riches that can be found, for example, in satisfying relationships, living in harmony with nature, and being of service to the world. There's several different misconceptions about what voluntary simplicity is all about. Um, some of the misconceptions is that voluntary simplicity implies we sort of check out from mainstream society, um, no longer engage, no longer consume. And again, this is not true. We're not checking out. Simplicity implies being present, being purposeful, deliberate, conscious in what we do rather than sort of distracted and checked out and uh, not really thoughtfully consuming, right? It's about being deliberate and present. It's not about just getting back to nature or reverting as a hermit into the woods and living some sort of rural lifestyle. Um, most people that live a lifestyle of voluntary simplicity live in the cities or the suburbs. Um, it's about Sort of, it's not about being isolated or going out into nature. It's about making the most of wherever you are. Um, and so these misconceptions, these are false. Also, the voluntary simplicity movement, this change really in values and ideology and action, it has to be collective. It must be a collective struggle for it to be effective. Uh, we all have to be involved and make conscious changes not just as individuals, but also individuals coming together to form groups collectively so that we can act changes at the policy and the planning and the structural level. And it can be done. It's happened before. It might be happening right now. Um, the tobacco lobby, for example, they lied for decades about the safety of their products. They knew, they had the data, the science, the research that showed cigarettes caused cancer, um, 
increased death rates. They knew, and they lied about it. Um, eventually, they were taken, not taken down, but eventually uh, they were beat in this sense. Um, they're no longer able to lie about this. Everyone's well aware of the risks of smoking. Um, and actually, just as a quick side note, so I mean, so this has happened before. We've overcome powerful corporations. We've enacted change at this large scale level before. On the note of the tobacco lobby, um, I am from Reno, Nevada. And so, oh, well, uh, well a while ago now, uh, let's see, well, it's the last class. So I'm 34, so almost 15 years ago. Um, the tobacco lobby had lied about some shit, one of the many lies they've told, and they were too stupid basically to shred the papers that contained the lies they had told, and so they got busted red-handed for it. And at the time, the senator in Nevada, Harry Reid, took the money that the tobacco industry had to pay for, for lying, for sort of um, to basically to compensate, um, to, to, because they were found guilty of lying. And Harry Reid took that money, millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even in the billions, and used it to fund higher education in Nevada. So that when I went to school, uh, anyone that got a, like a, over a 3.0, they kept kind of raising the GPA because they started to run out of money. But anyone at first that graduated with a 3.0 in high school, it kind of went up to like a 3.5, I think, by the time I got it. Um, you automatically got the Millennium Scholarship, which was up to $10,000 that would pay up to 75% of your t tuition and cost classes. So you had to find a way to cover like the other 25%. But it was available to every single graduating um, high schooler in Nevada. So the tobacco industry paid for my bachelor's degree, essentially. Um, changes happened before. Powerful corporations have been overturned before. So this Monsanto right now just recently lost another court case for millions of dollars for lying about the safety of their products, which they know glyco um, glyphosate causes cancer. Um, so it's happened before. It can happen again. We have to come together as a group if we want to change things at the structural and policy level. We cannot fight groups as individuals. We need to come together collectively. Um, and so read, read Elgin and also the Bodley reading for today for sure. We're sort of touching on it, but it's a really good way to wrap up the course and bring together a lot of what we've been talking about this semester. Um, and as Bodley says, the problems we face are not isolated problems. They are interconnected. Our problems, including desolate poverty, global warming, over-exploitation of our resources, destruction of the world's terrestrial and marine habitats, energy source depletion, high extinction rates, this increasing gap between the rich and the poor or the rest of us. These problems are not isolated problems. They comprise a tightly intertwined and fundamentally interrelated system of problems that is related to our current way of life. It is related to the way our society is organized. It's related to our culture. And so if our problems are cultural problems, as Bodley says they are, then we need cultural solutions. Um, Bodley says our problems are not human problems. They are not problems of human nature and they will not be solved by narrow technological approaches. Our problems are cultural problems. They relate to the overall organization of our societies, especially elite directed growth. And our solutions therefore have to be cultural as well. Um, he also says bought from Bodley, an analysis of contemporary human problems we're facing is incomplete without considering the cultural organization of wealth and power in this world. And Elgin touches on this too. They both say, right, we need a revolution in fairness in order to live sustainably. Um, abject poverty alongside gross conspicuous consumption is gonna always keep people at odds. Um, we will never achieve ecological justice without achieving more social justice. We need a more equitable sharing of the world's resources, right? So that we don't have to spend so much money on the military. That's where most of the money goes. You hear politicians talking about, we don't have money for your education or your healthcare. There's tons of fucking money. It's about where the money goes. 
um, without more peaceful societies, without less fighting, um, we, will, we have to continue to divide, divert resources towards that. So this is another thing they talk about that needs to change. So how do we measure progress anyways? And what, what does progress mean? It's a problematic term. It's value laden for one. And what is meant by it? Uh, what is progress? Is it running water? Is it electricity? Is it wealth? Is it inequality? Is it having an iPhone? I, I like my phone. Um, is it, but also is it, you know, while a billion people are over consuming, we have another billion that are malnourished and starving and potentially dying from hunger. Is that progress and progress for who? And so the main way, one of the, typically the way that we measure progress, um, at least the developed world is through GDP, is through material wealth, money. Uh, GDP, gross domestic product, just to define it, is the annual market value of all goods and services produced by all firms and organizations, foreign and domestic, operating in one country. In short, it's a country's annual income, right? Uh, how much wealth per annum, annual. We need new ways to measure progress. GDP simply measures economic turnover. And this is assumed, economic growth, material wealth, this is assumed to measure well-being, social well-being, but clearly it does not. Well-being is not just about the economy. Um, and also just because the economy is huge or there's been lots of growth or the stock market is doing great, it doesn't mean everyone in that society is doing great. How is that wealth actually being distributed? Uh, and so well-being isn't just about GDP, it's about a decent standard of living for everyone. There, we need other indicators to measure progress more holistically. Um, we need new ways to measure this and ways that also include environmental indicators with attention to sustainability because if we overshoot the very resource base that we depend on, um, is, is that progress? We need to also account for sustainability as well. Um, a couple of alternatives to GDP, alternative ways to measure well-being, since that's what GDP is supposed to measure, even though it just captures economic turnover. Alternatives include the genuine progress indicator, which I have an example of on the next slide, and also the happy planet index. Um, and the happy planet index is an index, it comes from a small country uh, called Bhutan. It's sort of pictured in green on the slide uh, next to India. And they came up with it. And one of the main reasons, sort of main lines of thinking behind it is that people's main goal in life is not usually to be rich. Um, Maybe growing up in the U.S., there's there's a bit of that ideology, sort of the bootstrap and be, the, this assumption that wealth will result in happiness. Um, the data just doesn't support that. And so one of the driving lines of thinking behind the Happy Planet Index is the goal of most people is not to be rich, but to be happy. And so we need to account for other variables that influence happiness. It's not just about money. I mean, money matters. It, it has an effect. If you're below the breadline and can't eat, uh, there tends to be lower levels of happiness. And that's true, right? You need to have your basic standards, uh, basic needs met. Um, there's also a slight correlation with those that are ultra wealthy tend to be high, slightly higher levels of happiness compared with um, those in the sort of bottom quarter of society. It's for everyone else in the middle that there's not really a correlation. Um, so it matters to an extent. You have to have your needs met. But beyond that, we get into problems of relative wealth and all these other things. It's just not the only thing that matters. Um, so the Happy Planet Index would be considered really undeveloped, uh, doing very poor if measured just through GDP, just through money. The country, but the country ranks really high on the Happy Planet Index, like 13 out of 178. 
and they're ranked high because they're measuring all these things outside of GDP, like life satisfaction, which is, hey, are you happy with your life? Are you satisfied with your job? Um, what's the life expectancy? How long are people living? What's the ecological footprint? Um, do they people have access to green space? Um, how is the environment? Is it sustainable resource use? Um, leisure time. Do you have a life work balance? Um, spiritual life, right? Do you have time to go to church if that's one of the things that you're into? Uh, fair governance. Do you have a government that actually responds to your needs, your questions, your concerns? It, it includes all these other social and environmental indicators that also matter, that also go so much, maybe more than money, into actual social well-being. <clears throat> Um, so there's a link on the bottom of the slide to, to the URL for the Happy Planet Index website, and I urge you to check it out. I've also caught, you can copy and paste it from the YouTube text box description for this video. Um, pop it in your browser at some point, af maybe after the lecture, and just check it out. Play around. You can click on the different countries and see how they're ranked and uh, what goes into the different rankings. Um, I'll tell you right now, the U.S. is red. They're ranked kind of low. And one of the main reasons stated is the U.S. has a major problem with inequality. Um, their words, not mine. Um, so Happy Planet Index, that's one alternative. Gross domestic product is not a good measure of social well-being. So if you look just at GDP on this chart, you can see the country of Qatar, sort of a little small oil country in the Middle East. They are ranked Number one in terms of GDP, which if you measure solely in terms of this means they're sort of the highest, most developed country, right? Most well-off country, if you will. Um, not so in Qatar on the ground. And if you look, if you look on the Happy Planet Index, how Qatar ranks up when, when you start to include social and environmental indicators, all this other stuff outside of sort of the country's GDP, which of course is going to be high because they're exporting a bunch of oil. If you look on HPI, Happy Planet Index, they're ranked very low, right? Which implies that they're not that well off. Um, and so GDP does not measure sort of happiness or sustainability or even really social well-being. Uh, it's a measure of monetary wealth. And the way in which that wealth is distributed is is also very important um so just like when you see the stock market going up or the dow or the nasdaq oh a record day i mean has that actually tangibly impacted your life that day are you making more money right it, they don't necessarily correlate and bodley sort of also points out that many countries with really high gdps don't rank very high on the happy planet index they rank low and then the reverse is also true. Countries with fairly low GDPs, like Bhutan, for example, um, rank much higher on the Happy Planet Index. Uh, and so there's not necessarily a relationship between GDP and overall social well-being. How income in the country is distributed and what it's used for makes a huge difference in how the people are actually doing. This is an example of the genuine progress indicator. And so the genuine progress indicator is a combination of several things. Um, it still includes GDP, so income and the overall economy, but it also adds to GDP benefits that are not included in market transactions, um, things like literacy or lower infant mortality rate, healthcare, education, all these other social indicators and also subtracts uh, harmful environmental and social costs. So pollution, um, the things involved with sustainability, fair wage, fair governance, all these other things, and subtracts that. And so if you look at the graph, if you look at uh, GDP, gross domestic product, which is the darker of the two colors, you can see from 1950 to 2000, that's been going up and up and up. It looks like things are getting better and well-being's been going up this entire time. But if you look at genuine progress indicator, sort of that gray lighter color, um, which looks at GDP, but then also accounts for other social indicators, minus the harmful things that are occurring in the society, those externalities. 
And you can see from GPI, there's no real change in well-being, even though GDP suggests progress. Um, GPI shows that things are stagnant. Um, despite this corresponding increase in wealth. We need new ways to measure progress or well-being, especially if progress is, is meant to imply social well-being and not just money. A common argument that you'll hear is, well, that's great, and we care about social and environmental problems, but there's not enough money to deal with that stuff. Things cost money. The first thing I would say to that is we spent two trillion in uh, pay raise for the ultra rich 1% last year um, through tax cuts, which is literally akin to a paycheck. Um, can you imagine how much we could have funded for education or healthcare with two trillion dollars? That was just money just given to the wealthy, right? To stimulate the economy as part of trickle down economics, Reaganomics. Um, I think the money could be used to create jobs and trickle down in other ways and in turn actually improve social well-being. So there's a lot of money. It's about how the money gets prioritized and used and what's being valued and what is not being valued. So take a look at the chart. Um, some examples for you and on the left is expenditures per year needed to do various things like reforest the earth, um, deal with the AIDS pandemic protect biodiversity, uh, et cetera, eliminate hunger and malnutrition. So you can sort of look through all the different things and the associated costs and the total earth restoration and social budget on the bottom there. And then if you look over on the right, expenditures per year, these are 2008 numbers. What is spent per year on the world military? 1.4 trillion, the US military, um, and that's gone up since then. And then what we spend in the US on dog food, 39 billion, U.S. highways, 29 billion, U.S. foreign aid, U.S. potato chips and similar snacks, we spend 22 billion per year, U.S. cosmetics, makeup, 8 billion, um, and then the U.S. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, 7.2 billion. And so just to highlight a few examples uh, for you, look at dog food, 39 billion. With what we spend in the U.S. each year on dog food, we could provide basic health care uh, for everyone in the world and then have six billion left over to go buy some bourbon. If we took away the 29 billion we spend on U.S. highways, uh, which, as we discussed last lecture, aren't much of a solution to our traffic problems anyways, then we could fund and deal with, let's see, uh, the global AIDS epidemic, um, plus let's say reforest the earth, and how about restore fisheries? What is that, 13, that's 23 billion, that's 29 billion. So highways um, or reforest the earth, deal with, or excuse me, restore fisheries um, and deal with the AIDS epidemic. And if you look over at the, the world military and the US military, you see these markers right here. If you took just this portion of this 1.4 trillion spent on the world military, or just this portion of the almost trillion, the, the 73 billion, or excuse me, $734 billion spilt on, spent on the US military, if you take just these little fractions of these military budgets, you can pay for all of this, the entire earth restoration and social budget. Um, so we have lots of fucking money. That's a bullshit argument that there's no money. That's not true. It's about how it gets prioritized, who decides where it gets spent, and what, pe what people's values are. What kind of world do you want to live in? Um, and on top of that, what type of leaders have we elected? Do they share the values that we share? What kind of world do you want to fucking live in? There is money. That's a bullshit argument that there's not. And maybe some of you might be saying at this point, what kind of snowflake lefty liberal put up this bullshit data? Well, this data comes from the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the U.S. Department of Commerce, the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, the World Bank, Earth Policy Institute, and Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. So it's not fudged. The money is there. It's about priorities and values. And, and what kind of world do you want to live in? 
Um, one more example, this idea that is there not enough money. And so um, Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry Ice Cream is going to explain kind of a similar thing about the federal budget and is there enough money? Um, the answer is yes. It's about how we prioritize spending it. And he sort of, they give a breakdown of the budget and expenditures through Oreo cookies because um, they're ice cream guys. So it's only three and a half minutes. Go ahead and pause the lecture and either type this link into your browser or you can copy and paste the link from the YouTube description box. Um, watch it. It's three and a half minutes. Watch it and then go ahead and come back to the lecture. So hopefully you watch the clip. We have money. That's not true that there's not enough money. Again, it's about how it gets spent, um, what people's values are, what kind of world do you want to live in, right? And, and we have a say in what that looks like. You know, get out there and vote. Get involved. We're not broke. That's bullshit. And also sort of one of the last points that they make is we need to come together um, as, as individuals to form groups um, if we want to actually create change. Just some final sort of thoughts um, on the course. Human ingenuity and ecological use. How do we realize the advantages and relieve the disadvantages? How do we take advantage of the uses our ecology and environment provides us without creating so many social and environmental disadvantages and problems? There's many successful examples throughout time and space, cross-culturally to draw upon for this. Anthropology may not have all the answers. Oftentimes I give you no answers, um, but we do have good questions. The questions you ask are just as important as the answers. Um, the way that we conceptualize problems and their causes, the questions we ask, the way we frame our understanding influences the solutions we choose. And if you're not asking good questions in the first place, if you're not understanding the problem correctly, what's the point in the answers anyways? Famous anthropologist, British guy, uh, famous for establishing participant observation, uh, sort of going at what we do when we go do field work. Bronislaw Malinowski, uh, and he said, the ideal for anthropology is explaining us to ourselves, making humankind more intelligible to itself. And think about it. We often don't really think very critically about why we do what we do. Why do you do what you do? It's not necessarily natural or inevitable or the only way. It's cultural. Why do other people think and behave how they do? We're products of culture. You want to understand the causes and solutions to our problems? Understand the framework, the culture in which we live first. Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology, um, Nate called that because his contributions were so influential and still are to this day. And the quote that's actually on our syllabus, a knowledge of anthropology enables us to look with greater freedom at the problems confronting our civilization. You want to understand the causes of and solutions to our problems, understand the culture in which we live first. In anthropology, it's not only important for understanding ourselves better, but also for seeing the wealth of alternatives to human environment interaction out there that are provided by other societies throughout space and time. If anything, anthropology can hopefully give you hope. The way things are today are not fixed. They are not set in stone. They are not inevitable. They never have been and they are not now, we truly are in control of our own destiny. People created it, people can change it. And this is more true now than in all of human history. Uh, we're shaping our future so much so that we have ushered in a new geological epoch. We've entered the Anthropocene. So let's make sure we shape it how we want it, right? We have control over that.
we're sort of at a crossroads. Um, there's a lot of conflicting things going on. And the road we take in the future, that's up to us. And so with that, um, I really, I can't wait to see what you all do. You are my hope. Uh, and I really, really mean that. And I'm excited to see what the fuck you do with the future. Shape it how we want. Okay, so with that, that wraps up the course. Um, I really enjoyed having you all in person and also as we've transitioned online. Thank you for a good semester. Um, I know it was a weird semester for everyone. And I just want to also say you guys have been really awesome. You've been wonderful. And um, it, my outdated way of saying mad props to all of you um, for making it this far. It's, it's not been easy. And so good job. You guys have all done really, really well. Um, please, please contact me if you have questions about anything. Don't forget we have the final exam uh, in about a week. Uh, good luck on the final. Work hard, study engaged. Um, and again, my door is open to all of you in now and in the future. All right, take care.